Good evening. So I'd just like to introduce the members of the panel so you know what they look like. So one, Larry Rhodes, Lawrence Rhodes, the director of the Juilliard Dance Department. <laughs> Former New York dancer in the Harkness and the Joffrey, who is very familiar to some of you, I'm sure. And Josephine Ann Endicott, who was one of the original members of Pina Bausch's Tanz Theater. Again, I'm sure that many of you saw her at the Brooklyn Academy of Music at the Tanz Theater of Wuppertal came here. And John Giffen, who joined the company twice, actually. He danced in Wuppertal. Come sit down, join us. Uh, so, uh, Josephine was in the original cast of Cantata, the work that the Juilliard students are doing, and John uh, learned it after it had been made. And the other member is Maria Delena, who was the understudy to Josephine in the company. <laughs> <laughs> but, Thanks, <Joseph. laughs> Somehow Josephine never got sick. <laughs> Somehow. And these are the people who have been teaching it to, to the Juilliard students. And before we begin to talk, we'd like to show you uh, probably the most important creator involved tonight, and that is the late Pina Bausch. So you will see her on the screen receiving uh, one of the 2008 Dance Magazine Awards the year before her death. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel very moved to receive the Dance Magazine Award 2008 in this city. What all happened to me in New York? All these incredible people I met and learned from. All these unforgettable memories which formed and influenced me forever. Especially I thank Harvey Liechtenstein who invited us at the very beginning. And of course the whole Brooklyn Academy family. So Melillo and not at least the wonderful New York audience. When I was 18 years old, I was traveling all alone to America without able, being able to speak a word of English. My parents took me to the port of Cuxhaven. A brass band was playing as a ship was setting off and everybody was crying. I went onto the ship and waved. My parents were also waving and crying and I was standing on the deck and crying too. It was terrible. I had the feeling we would never see each other again. Then I wrote a short letter to Lucas Hoving in New York and posted it on the way to Le Havre. Lucas has been one of the teachers in Volkwang School in Essen. I was very much hoping that he would pick me up in New York. Eight days later, when I arrived in New York, I didn't have my health cert certificate in my bag, but it was in my suitcase. Therefore, I had to spend many hours on the ship waiting until the over thousand passengers has been dealt with. Finally, they took me to my suitcase. I no longer expected that Lucas would still be there, even if he had received my letter. Yet, when I walked off the ship, 13 hours later, he was still standing there. Hanging over his arm were flowers that had wilted in the meantime. <laughs> Poor Lucas, he had been waiting for me all this time. This, for me, unforgettable memory shows how I was welcomed then, and how I feel welcomed each time I come to New York. Thank you very much. I should say that, as it will probably come out later, that Pina Bausch enrolled in Juilliard 
and took classes from Anthony Tudor and Jose Limon and Anna Sokolow. And the connection with Juilliard remains strong and of course now is going to be even stronger. Uh, we'd like to show you now a, a film that Larry has called Ghosty, uh, a film from the first performance of this piece, Cantata, to Igor Stravinsky's choral piece of the same name. Uh, it was 1975, and uh, the um, film, as you will see, is not great quality, but you will see Josephine in her role in the dance. So if the crew has that set up, perhaps we could look at it.
one thing. <laughs> she had a ghost, or several. <laughs> um, one thing that you will not see tonight is the set. If you go to Juilliard to see it in December, there are three scrims, right? And they divide the stage into four rooms. So there's a, an, a certain visual effect uh, you, that you are not seeing here. But if you go to Juilliard, you will also hear the music played live because Juilliard is full of wonderful young musicians, and that is not the case, has not been the case previously with the work. It's been performed to recorded music, and not since the 70s, right? 79. 79. And um, one of the reasons it's being revived uh, is in honor of the, well, it's a little bit confusing. This is the 40th anniversary of Tanztheater Wuppertal, right? And, um, this piece was made in 75, but in honor of, the, of that anniversary, it's going to be performed on its original program with Pina Bausch's Rite of Spring and another short piece, just as it was then. So what's interesting is the collaboration between Juilliard and Essen and the members of Wuppertal. So Larry uh, is the one, one of the people who set this in motion. I guess Mari was another. And he happened to be in Europe uh, and had a chance to go to Wuppertal and see a performance of Pina's uh, last work and began to talk with the directors of the company and they showed him this film, right? That's right. Um, that's why I thought it was interesting in a bit to show this film because it was the only evidence uh, of the work that was then existing. And uh, so looking at this ghosty old film, was actually something that encouraged me to say, yes, let's pursue this. And that was about uh, two and a half years ago. So the conversation actually started with Dominique Merci uh, when they were in Brooklyn about four years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it takes a while to get these projects really working. But the other thing I thought to say about this show is that there are actually 26 dancers in the show, and you're only going to see seven tonight. So. You're, you're just seeing a portion of that, and there's a large group that you, of course, are not going to see. Yeah, there's a, a, a massive chorus, and one of the interesting things is that it's being taught also to the Folk von Schule in Essen, where Pina Bausch studied, just as she studied at Juilliard, and that there's going to be a slight interchange of dancers, right? Eight dancers from Essen are going to come perform in, at one of the Juilliard performances, and vice versa. Yes, and That's eight dancers from here will go to uh, Wuppertal actually to dance with dancers from Essen. So I think the, you know, the 40th anniversary, the two schools that were really important in Pina's development, which would have been Essen and Juilliard, uh, all of this has to sort of come together to celebrate the 40th anniversary of her company by presenting this landmark evening, which was actually put together about two years after the after the company started. So Joe, can you talk a little bit about when you worked with Pina on this piece, about her process in making the work, how she worked with you, how she worked with the others? Well, uh, it's a very long time ago. It is really 40 years ago, and I'm happy to be still alive and able to teach it <laughs> and not be the ghost that it might look like then <laughs> we are. Um, Pina, in those days, she was choreographing, we always actually with the dancers, but all the movements were coming from herself. But the, um, the artist or the person with whom she was choreographing was very important because she took from this person what this person is giving her mind, body, soul as a person, as a dancer, whatever. So it was really close development, to togetherness. And um, uh, I'm getting lost because uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's also very emotional, the whole thing, bringing this back to its original state after so long and being so long myself in the company. 
It's very beautiful now to be able to make it round with the dancers from Juilliard. We're very happy with the work we've done here, especially with the two girls learning my part. It's, it's a very beautiful process finding what the work was, what it is and what it always will be, getting the soul of the piece of the dancers able to breathe, get the pureness of the piece, the fine detail, the spiritual body of the soul back on the stage. And um, one of the things um, that I think most of us here who've seen Pina Bausch's works and seen you in those works, with the exception of Rite of Spring, they have, and, and some of the most recent works, they've been primarily works of dance theater with talking and singing and many other scenic effects. Are, are, are you, can you say how that, when that change happened in her work? It seemed to be, because Cantata is full of dancing, it's a dance piece. Um, at what point did she begin to get interested in having you do all those other things? Uh, when, she f when I first met Pina in London, I had come from the Australian Ballet Company. It was a very classical company. And you really see that my part is that of a classical dancer. So Pina just took me after this little class. She saw me in, an, in the dance center and thought, said to herself and to me, I'm a born natural dancer. Um, and when she f only had seen this, she didn't know that there are so many other sides towards me. So after rehearsal in those days, we used to meet and go for a drink or for dinner or ice cream. And then she saw, you know, Joe can laugh really well. Joe can, is very entertaining. Joe has so many sides to her. Why not use, use something else in the next piece, you know, like talking on stage or playing around with the public? It was a whole, over 40 years, she was on a journey. She had her vision and it took 40 years to get there. Indeed. So, John, you joined and you, this piece had already been choreographed. And yes, you, it had. You had, left, you had been in the company, then you left for a year. That and is came correct. Back. That is yes. correct. And so, how, what, somebody taught you the part, you performed in it, I know. What, yes, we, we learned it very quickly because with Pina's work, it was process, 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 process until the first performance and maybe then a little process past that, but then it was um, kind of, it was set. So I <laughs> learned it as I would any piece of choreography. So the Juilliard dancers, it's no difference from me learning it the next cast than the Juilliard dancers learning it today. Well, so it, it, there, is a, the, the, there is a difference because you were coming in as a returning person to a group of people who already knew it. So you were the new guy on the block. There were, there were several of us that year, I'm yes, happy to say, including Mari, we, yes. we, we came back. And did, what, what was that, was that experience, even though you had to learn it quickly, did you have strong feelings about the work? I had very strong feelings about the work, but I think that came through the dancing of it. Mm -hmm. The learning of, of it is one thing, but then we danced it all over the world. We took it on the Far East tour. So the next three years, we danced the whole evening quite a bit. And I learned to love the whole evening because mm -hmm. it made such great demands on me as an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, starting off with this spiritual piece, then going on to the uh, Zweite Frühling Second Spring, which is a comic piece, then ending up with this primal, brutal if you will, um, um, right of spring. So this was wonderful for me as a dancer. Yes, I think you said that the whole program was originally called Spring Offering. Yes. The, the right of spring with this and another small piece. Yes. That. So, Mari, too, did, what did you learn from this experience of, of working on this piece but not performing it? Well, uh, oh, working on the well, solo and not performing it? Well, no. <laughs> that was a little well, that depressing. Was, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was not so good. But <laughs> let's put it this way. <laughs> what did you learn from working well, actually, on this piece? When we came into the company, we had two weeks to learn like five pieces. We learned Iphigenia, Orpheus, Sacra, the Cantata, 
um, the Brecht Ab, and yeah. I mean, we just in two weeks, so it was a little different from the Juilliard people learning it, because mm -hmm. we had to learn all those ballets That's in two true. weeks. Then we had this, I guess it was a two-week festival or something. And cantata was actually, to me, very important because it was such a ballet piece, and I always wanted to bring it to a ballet company also. I thought it was one of Pina's pieces that could go out more to a ballet company than other pieces of hers. And um, what impressed me most with the cantata was my costume was too short in the arms. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't stretch my arms out how we were supposed to stretch our arms out. And I was a little not happy about that, but it's, it's just, just a beautiful piece. And what it taught me with Pina was the, um, with also Orpheus, is the, the timing of Pina's pieces are not on the music, they're just actually the breadth of the music. And I think that's very, it, that's what we're trying to teach these other, these mm -hmm. young people, that it's not the beat of the music, it's the breadth of the music. I think, uh, also you mentioned a costume. You, you're not going to see costumes tonight. You're not going to see the flowing, strappy evening gowns that are Pina Bausch uh, style. Or what do the men wear, suits and? Yes, quite often suits. Quite often suits. Uh -huh. Not in here. Not in here. Shirts, no. pants and shirts. Yeah. So you won't see that. You'll see dark, stylish practice clothes. So if or do you think the dancers are ready back there so that Joe can introduce this first section that we're going to show? Sure. Well, the first section is going to be more or less what you saw, the ghosts, but in real. <laughs> and. Um, in those days, when Pina first took me, I was also, as you saw on the ghost video, that I was quite chubby. <laughs> but this sort of didn't worry Pina. So, but the thing that worried me was that I was in this very see-through through dress and the beginning, I'm just sitting down. But Pina believed in Jo and in all her dancers and this gave me the courage to sit there, to get up and dance as beautifully, as pure, as innocent. Just be yourself and, sh and let your body sing. Let it sing, be the music, and be yourself. And Pina gave me this courage, which lasted me also for nearly almost 40 years to stay with her. So Joe, who are we going to see perform? We're going to see Christina Bentz. Christina. And uh, Bin Ho, Bin Ho, and Tanner Van Kuren, mm -hmm. and who else in this episode? Um, Michelle. Taylor. Michelle Taylor and Michelle in the front. The two women here: T Taylor Drury and Michelle Carter. And Daphne joins them later All in right. the group, and uh, Alex also joins them in the group. All right. So we'll see that now, please. Hope you like it. <laughs> <laughs>
better than the ghost, so. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, John, that Pina, you said Pina said to you it was about three things? Yes, she said it's, um, she wrote on a piece of paper, Geburt, Geburt, Liebe, Tod. Birth, love, death. It's, it's very, having watched the rehearsals and how the large chorus interacted with this, it's, it's, beautiful to see these relationships that are not part of a story or a conventional narrative, but you see what sister, mother, lover, what, what you wish, and the, the cot that is also on stage you saw in the film is, will be there. So Larry, when you decided to present this to the Juilliard graduating class as a project, were they daunted? Were they worried? What did they? Oh, they were, they were thrilled. Um, <clears throat> I announced this last year that we would be dancing a piece of Pina Bausch in December, and I thought the roof was going to come off. I mean, they were so excited about it. I mean, the truth is also that Pina Bausch never gave her company, her works, to any companies outside the Paris Opera Ballet, which has two the Rite of Spring and her version of Orfe, and she's done some work with the school in Essen. But apart from that, nobody else in the world dances her work. So it's really an extraordinary uh, kind of honor for us to be part of this project and celebration and to uh, be part of bringing this whole uh, beautiful Stravinsky program to life. To live music. To live music. Are, 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 they, are they singing in German here? They yes, are, they are. Yes. Because the, the, this Stravinsky cantata uh, is, uh, the, the, the libretto uh, that he was working with are anonymous old English folk, folk songs and poems. So I keep hearing the German and I'm thinking, mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but... Um, I, I think I heard also that, um, that the French, the Paris Opera actually does Orphée in German. Yeah, we well, did it in yeah. German. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, working, what have you had to stress particularly in working with these students, Joe? I see you working always with, I see you doing this, I see you. <laughs> Quality. Getting the limits, the limits, not being satisfied until it goes to the end, the end, Christina, get to the end, <laughs> the end. Do I have to show it to you? <laughs> and, and then I get up and, and amazingly enough, I, I, I think, Mari, if that's right, <laughs> if I really, really want to show them properly, I really have to show it myself because that's a part of what I think the best way to construct a, a, a Pina piece is if the original or some of the originals are still around. And so, it, even now when I see them, I've already got corrections <laughs> for tomorrow. And, you know, 
all these tiny little details, this beautiful little movement of just this. It's all got to be, it has to become theirs, but it's, they have to be a copy and then it has to be, belong to them. And this new, new thing of sitting in the hip, um, the breath, the breath that takes the arms up, where does the movement start? What is dance? Uh, let, let free, let free, go more, 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 more. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> well, you see, the, to see the three of them working in rehearsal, you know, sort of pulling the people together and, and Mari has her graphs and her notes and her, what do you, uh, the, the actual reconstructing of the whole piece, mm. did you do some of that, the two of you, did, did you do some of that before you ever came to work with the kids? Oh yes, we worked oh. at least yes. an hour, uh, a whole year. Oh. oh. <laughs> yes. yes, watching those ghosts, you know, 10,000 times. Yes. We're, we're about blind now, I mean, you know. I might have been a bit lucky because if you've ever created something with Pina, it sits in your body yeah. somewhere. Yes. Very, it's yes, look, in there, but... But Pina was very, very... Uh, <coughs> ping, pinglish, what's pinglish picky, in English? Picky. Um, picky. So, I mean, every finger has to be... Look, these hands, yeah. you know, this is difficult. Isn't to get bad, these hands bad. up. They, they go either like this. But uh -huh. Pina is a world of arms, Pina's <laughs> works. <laughs> and also, <laughs> it's very and interesting because, you know, these are beautifully trained, receptive young dancers. Indeed. But I think they're, uh, in today's world, often the, the kind of dancing that they learn is bigger and more general. So for them to have to get a tiny detail, not just of shape, but... So I see the you all working in rehearsal at that you know, that, the timing. All the timing, the music. Mm. Yeah. And the movement really comes from their insides, yeah. not at all from the outside. And I think also, um, we, um, Pina was a student of, of Yos, who was a student of Laban. So it goes, uh, Laban being the um, famous Hungarian dance theoretician of his time. And these transitions, these round transitions, these uh, ways of moving are not in every dancer's vocabulary this, the, the, right now. How you lead from the elbow, how right. all these things that are so important for Pina, mm -hmm. these, as, as Joanne mentioned, these parts of the body that lead, these, um, these waves that go through the body, mm -hmm. through that, yes, through that breath and everything, they're really important, mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily a part of a dancer's training today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that um, that all those things are true, and and that in fact the dancers have appreciated very much entering this world, uh, which demands of them some some detail and some kind of um, focused attention to movement, music, breath. That that they are, they appreciate very deeply. That they feel expanded by working on the piece. Mm -hmm. I think if the dancers are ready, John, can you tell us what we're going to see now? Yes, we're going to um, continue on with the section that we, we, started, we saw, where Tanner came down. Um, Tanner's playing a part that was originally done by Ed, forever to be known as Ed Solo. Anyhow, Tanner is, um, we, we're going on toward the end of that, then we segue into one of the chorus sections. Unfortunately, today we only have a chorus of four. I think there's a chorus of 19 when you come to see us at Juilliard. And uh, we finish that section then at the end of the chorus. All right, let's see it. <laughs>
did, besides talking about birth and love and death, did Pina give any directions? This is your lover, this is your mother, nothing. Um, ever, never, never. Interesting. Because here, maybe she was just tired of it, because here she worked with Antony Tudor, who just asked his dancers if they could locate their character in relationship to what they had for breakfast that day and <laughs> do a thorough research into their backgrounds. So this is, this is a very restrained sort of style of mm -hmm. performing. I was thinking, too, of later works of Pina Bausch's, where you all did absurdly dramatic things. Did she just let those things happen because of the energy in them, the crazy speeches, the, the tearing each other apart? <laughs> I, think, I think she trusted us and she liked the material and she put it together in such a way that this was what she wanted. Mm -hmm. There was never one thing on, on any Pina Bausch stage that wasn't what Pina Bausch wanted. And she, of course, she did do things like ask you what's the worst memory of your mother you have or something. Did she... What didn't we do on stage, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Pri she asked private stories and then orchestrated yes. them. Pina was interested in every single aspect of your life, of relationships, of groups of people, in, in everything of, even if you'd had a fight with your boyfriend, how you'd come in the next day, uh, she could somehow use it. She could use everything and put it into a form, into an artistic form, and it became then part of her pieces. It was quite extraordinary. She would ask things like, not why do you cry, but how do you cry? I think it's a very, very interesting thing because mm -hmm. why we all cry, you know, who cares mm -hmm. why we cry mm -hmm. in some ways, but how you cry mm -hmm. and not how you cry, how you cry, you cry. Mm -hmm. I think this is very interesting. Individual. Yes, and that's why so, you know, why we remember you as performers here in New York so much because you are telling your stories. Yeah. As she went from like cantato with a, a diffused idea of what we were being or what we were supposed to be to a very personal way of performing. Each person was their own self or yes, actually that's what it was. Yes, and you sort of waited to hear what somebody's favorite song would be or what somebody's worst birthday present had been and it, it acquired humor and a great deal of pathos as well. Uh, but, you know, Pina was talking about when she left uh, Germany and she was crying and her parents were <laughs> waving goodbye. I mean, there's a scene in uh, Kontaktov where the group are all singing, you know, sing a song, what's a song, you know? And so we all start singing, my bonnie lies over the ocean. My bonnie lies over the sea. And on that day, I mean, talk about homesickness. <laughs> Germany to America is also very far. But Australia to Germany, and I didn't have anyone picking me up at this. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe sits there, and suddenly on that day, I don't, she didn't ask me to do that, start crying, Joe. It was just like suddenly. My body lies over the ocean. My body lies over the sea. And it all came in, back to me, and I started really crying. And no one told them, the group, to stop singing or get louder. But it all happened because Joe was suddenly crying and crying and crying. And then they all, oh God, poor Joe, and that's how they all stopped. Things happen sometimes just like that. But Pino then asked you to repeat it, and then it was in a piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We played that piece often. And, <laughs> yeah. then, and then she would say, but the, 
last time you did it a little differently. Yeah. <laughs> Three months later in the process. Right. Do you remember, John, that day? Oh, you yeah, when you had your list of questions and answers and you thought she particularly didn't like one of them, and that's the one she really liked, and you couldn't remember that one. <laughs> oh, it's months ago because sometimes we had millions of questions and answers. And yeah. then you just, she gave you a little paper with this, the questions that she liked. You put them together and then it became a solo or a dance or whatever. I think also if you want to, to see a, a, in public, if you want to see Joe coaching dancers, you should see the beautiful film called Dancing Dreams in which uh, the piece Kontaktov is taught to, well, you see the, uh, the cast, a uh, regular cast do it, but it also taught to people 65 and over and to school children or teenagers. Yeah. And to see Joe trying to get those qualities to children, I just remember the girl who came up to you and, and who, who was also helping you, uh, Ben Benedict. Benedict. Yes, Benedict. The girl said, you know, it's a little bit difficult because to do this thing we're doing right now because a boy has never touched me before. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, inhibited, the, yeah. Yeah. But the process, it's quite beautiful to see if you want to see that happen in public. Um, so, Larry, we, we're going to see some more dance right now, and you're going to show us two casts doing the same thing. Can you talk about that? Yeah, this is actually a duet that's uh, quite near the end of the piece, but for me it's a kind of climax of the dance as well. Um, the two dancers are going to be using all of the rooms that Deborah talked about earlier, even though we don't have them here. You'll have to imagine them. The four rooms stacked up with the scrim supporting, separating each one. And um, it's, it's actually to the piece of music of Stravinsky called Westron Wind, which is the name of the poem that Deborah was also talking about earlier. Um, we have two casts at Juilliard, and I was looking at it a couple of weeks ago, and I thought, they're, they're doing the same steps, and they're doing, they have the same musicality, and they have the same instruction in a way, but it's always interesting for me, and I hope for you, to, to actually see the difference that a dancer makes. So I decided that we would show this duet twice. So both, you're going to see both casts, and, um, and you'll see what you think about that. It's always interesting to see dancers take on a new role, and then if there's more than one of them, what difference does that make? So, so when the dancers we're going to see first are... Christina, Christina and Tanner. And Tanner, and then? And then Daphne with Alexander. Daphne with Alexander Anderson. Daphne Ferntberg and Alexander Anderson. So there'll be a pause in between. Yes.
As we uh, come, to a, come to an end, I would like to know a little bit more about the exchange with Essen, because you all three are working with those dancers as well. And do they, they know the piece yet? You too, Dan, right? They do. <laughs> <laughs> we had a bit longer uh, to teach it to them in, in Essen, in Essen Werden, because it was the first uh, run through sort of the first, we had to deal with the material if, if all our notes had been written down properly and it was a bit longer the process. Here it's kind of the second round of teaching. But now there are eight people going over from here, some to do chorus parts, some to do principles, and then the others are coming over here in December to be in one of the casts or at one performance? Two performances. Two performances. The first two performances here, we'll have a German artist with us. And uh, the first two performances there, uh, Americans will be dancing with the dancers from Essen. So in, in Wuppertal, it's, it's uh, November 11th, I think. <coughs> November 22nd, 22nd, 23rd, 24th for anyone who has a little country home in Wuppertal. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's already sold out. Sold out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. always difficult getting tickets. And, and here, General in, rehearsal. here in New York, it's, it is a December. December 11th through the 15th. And it's programmed with works by three 
young American choreographers. Exactly. Two of them, Julieta Lum. And of course, if you include Pina, there are three. Yes. Julieta Lum is on the program. Takahiro Uyama is uh, creating for freshmen. And Darrell Grand Moultrie is creating for third year students. And Brian Brooks is creating on second year dancers. So we'll have three creations and uh, our premiere of this win from the West. So uh, you should get your tickets early because I expect that will be sold out. Um, I'd like to thank the panel and thank the artists for performing and thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you Deborah. Thank you. Thank you.